Hi, welcome back to the Der Show. Uh, tonight is the beginning of the Jewish holiday of Purim. Uh, it's a holiday uh, celebrating the fact that the Persians, uh, now they're called Iranians, tried to kill the Jewish people uh, by, by genocide. And the Jews got together and engaged in a preemptive military attack, essentially, and prevented the Iranians from from uh, destroying them. Does that sound at all relevant to what's going on today? Are we going to have a real Purim? Will Israel eventually have to engage in a preemptive attack against the Iranian mullah's nuclear weapon? So tonight um, we go to the synagogue, people with COVID don't, and we read from an ancient scroll called uh, the Megillah of, of Esther. And um, it's, it's, it's an old scroll. It goes back hundreds and hundreds of years. The story goes back thousands of years. And uh, a cantor uh, reads from it. When I was a kid, I used to have to go around to disabled people and, and read uh, from it. So I still know how to read from it. See, you can still do it. Um, and uh, that just means there was a day when the king Ahasuerus, who we think is Xerxes, um, was ruling uh, uh, the nation of Persia, which extended from India to Ethiopia in those days. And, and so um, every time the name of the villain is mentioned, it's in the, in the, in the book, book it's, it's not Putin, it's, it's Haman, close, Haman. Um, you make a noisemaker and, uh, and, and you try to blot out his name so people won't, won't hear it. Look, every religion has its own traditions, every culture has its own tradition. So uh, tonight is Purim and in honor of uh, Haman or in memory of Haman, we eat a food called the humantashen. Uh, it's a triangular food made out of delicious filling um, in the shape of, a, of Haman's hat, a triangular hat. So if, if any of you are celebrating the holiday, may, may you enjoy your humantashen. Now to more contemporary, contemporary issues. So uh, today, you know, we heard two really interesting speeches, um, a heroic, uh, historic speech to the gathered members of Congress by uh, the president of, of, of Ukraine. It was a passionate speech. It was a brilliantly delivered speech. It uh, came full with uh, videotape that really told it all. And then this Ukrainian man spoke directly to President Biden in English and said, <clears throat> we need more. We need more. Uh, you're not doing enough. Uh, you know, they tell a, uh, a dark joke in, in, in um, Ukraine today. They say, oh, my God, the people of the world are running out of paint in the color of the Ukrainian uh, flag, the blue and the yellow. So they're not going to be able to do anything to help us now, suggesting the only thing that's really being done are protests. No, the United States is uh, sending military equipment, certainly slowing down the Russians. And... Uh, um, President made his speech. Um, now, President Biden, some of you wrote me nasty letters yesterday because I said I like him. He's a nice guy. He's a nice guy. I'm not telling you, uh, commenting on his politics. He's certainly no Winston Churchill. Um, and the speech he gave today was a workmanlike speech, uh, which he read from a teleprompter, obviously, uh, with a couple of interventions on his own. But uh, essentially, what he said was, we'll give you money, we'll give you some defensive weapons, we'll give you some stingers, we'll give you some of this. We're not going to have an open, he didn't say this, but it's what he didn't say, which was the important part of the speech. We're not going to do a no-fly zone. Uh, we're not going to um, send uh, MiGs from Poland to the battlefield in Ukraine from NATO. Um, and it's interesting because I'll talk about the, the letters later. But some of you people, just please listen, listen before you write. One person writes me, Dershowitz calling for a no-fly zone is brain dead. I never called for a no-fly zone. I don't support a no-fly zone. And then the answer to that is he agrees with Biden on Biden's no-fly um, uh, zone stance. That is, he's calling for the opposite of a no-fly fly zone. 
uh, and then one person. Of course, you've got to always get this in. Dershowitz is a lawyer, not a military technician. I doubt he even knows anybody that knows somebody who's been near the military. Now, that hits close to home. Um, my Uncle Morris served with great distinction uh, as a major in the United States Army, both during the Second World War and during the Korean War. He was buried with full uh, military honors. He got uh, numerous uh, uh, medals. Uh, <clears throat> my Uncle Harry uh, was supposed to be in on the invasion at D-Day. At the last minute, he wasn't called, but his first cousin, my second cousin, uh, was in the invasion and in the fight uh, the Battle of the Bulge and the fight for Berlin. Um, my cousin uh, died um, in uh, uh, the war of attrition in Israel. He was an Israeli uh, and he, he died uh, there. Uh, and I have for many years represented pro bono uh, members of the military, um, including a colonel, a number of high ranking officials who were charged with crimes and who obviously on military pay couldn't afford to pay for a lawyer. I'm a, a strong supporter of the American uh, military, and uh, how dare you, how dare you suggest on, on what sounds like bigoted grounds that I don't even know anybody who's in the military. Well, I do, and if I were, if I had been old enough and I had been in the right time frame, I probably would have served in the military. I would not have gone to Canada. I was opposed to the Vietnam War, but I would have served um, my country if, if I had been, if I had been called. Okay, so, Let's grade the, the two speeches. Um, you know, Zelensky is a force of nature. Uh, and uh, what he did today, he did previously to the British Parliament, to the Canadian uh, Parliament. He spoke from his heart. Uh, he spoke from his experience. Of course, he's going to ask for more than we can give him. That's the job of the president of a country. Um, Winston Churchill asked for more than he knew we could uh, give him. He pleaded with Franklin Delano Roosevelt to give us more than lend lease. Uh, he wanted us very much to get involved in the in the war, and we did not. Um, we put our own interests first, uh, and there was a, a "Don't get into the war" movement. The 1940 election was in part about that, and had the uh, Japanese um, Air Force not foolishly, foolishly, and self-destructively bomb Pearl Harbor and what they may have believed was a preemptive attack. They may have believed that we were going to get into the war anyway. It was foolish because even if we were to get into the war, we weren't going to get into the war. In the Pacific, we would have only gotten into the war in the Atlantic, only into the European war, but uh, obviously once attacked at Pearl Harbor, we had no choice. We got into the war. Congress, uh, on the day after December 7th, uh, declared war, uh, a day that will live in infamy. And we joined the battle, and I think between the United States and ironically, then the Soviet Union, Stalin and Roosevelt, they cornered Germany and pressured them from both sides, D-Day from uh, the, the west to the east, and Russia, after the failure of Hitler to um, destroy uh, both Ukraine and, uh, and Russia, closed in and ultimately, ultimately, and, and fortunately defeated Nazism. It's the last time that Russia and the United States worked together on, on anything. And it's interesting because we were allies at the time and uh, when the Rosenbergs, particularly Julius Rosenberg, gave atomic secrets to Russia, he was giving it to an ally at the time. Of course, they became a Cold War enemy, but uh, he was inappropriately sentenced to death under an espionage statute that really only operates uh, with enemies during wartime. But, you know, it's a story for, for another day. So, so Zelensky made, made a great speech. It, it couldn't have been better. One small criticism. Everybody's allowed a small criticism. He should never have mentioned the monuments. He talked about Mount Rushmore. Because at least for people like me, when you mention monuments in the past and who the heroes are, who the heroes are, Washington, Lincoln, you know, the heroes, you have to think of what's the comparable Mount Rushmore in Ukraine. It's the statue to Khmelnytsky, the massive barbaric genocidal killer of Jews and others. Uh, and that's who they celebrate. That's their Mount Rushmore. So again, you know, 
so many of my letters reflect this point of view, either all good or all bad. Um, I get letters saying, how can I say that Joe Biden's a nice guy? That, that must mean I support his politics. No, it doesn't mean that at all. You can, you can have very nuanced views of, of people and their policies. And so um, I think we need a, a, lot, more, a lot more nuance. So uh, definitely an A-plus for, uh, for Zelensky, even without grade inflation. When I started teaching at Harvard, the average grade was a C. Um, basically, there were Ds and Bs, about as many, A's and F's, about as many, and then most people got C's. Today, if you get a B, people sending, start sending you to the mental health facility, and there must be something wrong with you. How, how could you only get a B? There's been such incredible great inflation at most universities, particularly in some departments, not necessarily in science departments and, and other departments, but even with great inflation or without great inflation, in this case, uh, Zelensky gets an A+. Plus. He knows the room. He knows his audience. Uh, okay, yes, Mount Rushmore, but he also 9-11, uh, the Pearl Harbor. Uh, basically, what he said is we're experiencing 9-11 every day. An exaggeration. We lost 3,000 people on 9-11. They're losing hundreds of people, but uh, it presents a very, a very stark image of terror from the sky. And that's what Ukraine is experiencing now, not through terrorism, the way 9-11 occurred, but through Russian rockets, almost a thousand of them, uh, many of them hitting civilian targets. Today, there was a report that a rocket hit a theater that had clear marks in Russian and Ukrainian, apparently, children, children, that it's a sanctuary, that it's a civilian location, it's a bomb shelter, it's designed to help people. It's not a military facility, and yet the Russians bombed it. Did they target it, or was it an incidental bombing? We, we don't know. We, these are hard decisions to make, but when you start seeing one after the other after the other, there was a killing of 10 people standing on a bread line the other uh, day, and the military analysts think that was inadvertent, that they weren't targeting the people on the bread line. They were sending rockets in, and the rockets exploded and caused shrapnel, and it caused the tragic deaths of, of 10 people. And, um, and so, uh, you know, the issue is two issues. One, is Putin a war criminal? I think the answer to that is pretty simple. Yes, under any definition of war, proportionality, attacking civilians, aggressive warfare, he's at least a triple war criminal. Um, the next question is really one of policy. Should the president of the United States declare him a war criminal? Until today, he didn't. And in the speech, he didn't. But uh, apparently later in the day, he did use that term. I think that's too little too late. Of course, the United States doesn't have standing to bring uh, Putin to the International Criminal Court. We're not a member of the International uh, Criminal Court. Neither is Russia. But there is claims of jurisdiction. And Ukraine has exceeded to the jurisdiction of the International Criminal Court, which means the criminal court does have jurisdiction over crimes committed in Ukraine. How do you enforce that? Not an easy question. Um, but, um, but I'm glad the President of the United States did say he was a, a, a war criminal, and the people around him, and the soldiers who are ordering the destruction of civilian targets. We're not now talking about mixed targets or incidental targets. We're talking about targeting specifically areas that you know have no military importance whatsoever in order to inflict casualties on civilians. That's a war crime. It's a war crime the United States should be familiar with because we did it. We did it at Hiroshima. We did it at Nagasaki. We did it in Dresden. And uh, we've probably done it in other areas as well. We did it during the Vietnam War, um, other, other times as well. Um, Winston Churchill was very clear about it. He said, we're going to kill civilians, uh, drop bombs on civilian areas in order to demoralize the German people into uh, surrendering. That was probably the theory behind Hiroshima and, and, and Nagasaki as well. So, yeah, he's a war criminal, and I'm glad the president said so. Now, the president's speech itself it was a good speech. Um, I mean, it was a speech. He, standing next to him was... Uh, Secretary of State Tony Blinken and other other people. Obviously, it was a speech that was well prepared. 
by members of the administration. There are a lot of smart people around Putin. Uh, Blinken is very smart. I've known him for years. Uh, Jake Sullivan is the national security advisor. He's very smart. Uh, he was Hillary Clinton's uh, national security advisor and uh, a scholar, graduate of Yale Law School, uh, a very smart guy. Um, the speech itself was a pretty standard teleprompter speech, not very much passion, not very much new in it. Uh, the most important things were, were not said um, about the no-fly zone and the, the sending of, of jets, and the things that were said were good. Um, I think we have to spend uh, hundreds of millions and maybe even billions of dollars uh, strengthening uh, Ukraine, giving them all the medical assistance we possibly can. Everything short of World War III. Now, I don't think that President Biden did a smart thing by saying that the no-fly zone would be World War III. I, I don't think you do that because that sends the wrong message to, to Putin. Uh, it says that the United States is afraid of World War III and you can do anything you want to do as long as you don't cross the red lines, and there aren't any red lines. Um, there were red lines in the past. Um, President Obama said that the use of chemical weapons was a red line, and then he just just ducked it and, and, and forgot and erased the red line and allowed Syria, with Russia's help, to kill many, many, many uh, thousands of civilians by the use of uh, illegal um, chemical weapons. And it's certainly possible that there will be the use of chemical weapons. It's possible, I don't think, there'll be biological weapons in light of what the world has gone through with COVID. I, I doubt that anybody at this point would use uh, biological weapons. We know the Russians have them. And then there's the issue of tactical nuclear weapons. And people confuse tactical nuclear weapons and, and uh, strategic nuclear weapons. Uh, um, the Russians are not going to send nuclear bombs to New York because they know that that would cause the immediate counter-destruction of uh, Moscow, St. Petersburg, and uh, many, many other places. But could they use tactical nuclear weapons in the battlefield to destroy a city? I don't think they're going to do it. I don't think they're going to be the first country since Hiroshima and Nagasaki to introduce nuclear weapons into the battlefield, but we have to be prepared for it. Is that a red line? Uh, would uh, President Biden allow that to happen without provoking and answering? Uh, would NATO allow that to happen? Uh, does NATO really make any decisions without the United States? These are all questions that are going to be are going to be very very hard to uh, answer. There's one issue that really does upset me, um, and that is. Uh, the way Israel is being dragged into this. Uh, there are people now within the administration, outside the administration, I'm not talking about your typical crazies on the hard left, your typical crazies on the hard right, some of whom write to me. Um, uh, but I'm talking about mainstream people. I'm talking about the head of the Council on Foreign Relations. I'm talking about professors, mostly on the left, who say, well, you know, Israel really isn't doing enough. Um, they're not doing enough to condemn uh, Russia. First, they've condemned Russia unequivocally. Second, there are more Israelis on the ground per capita than any other country in the world. Medical help and soldiers, Israeli soldiers, individuals, have volunteered to fight with Ukrainians. So the, 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 the argument is, is a false one. But the worst argument is, you know, the United States is entitled to consider the interests of its citizens first before the Ukraine. And, and Britain is entitled to consider its citizens first, and France, is, but not Israel. Israel must put its own interests secondary to the interests in stopping the war with Ukraine. Do we not remember who is on Israel's northern border right now? Russia, the Russian military. Who is supporting Syria? The Russian military. Who is dealing with the Israeli military and trying to make deals as to what can be knocked out and what can be not knocked out? Who are the Russians supporting in Iran's effort to try to get a nuclear weapon, which they have said they would use to destroy Israel? The Russians. Israel has to play a very, very difficult balancing game, and it's done a great job. It has offered itself as part of negotiation. It spoke to both Putin and 
Zelensky, its prime minister and its other ministers did, but the world can't stop holding Israel to a double standard. Well, stop already. Just because Israel is the nation state of the Jewish people doesn't mean that unlike any other country in the world, it has an obligation to put other countries' interests before its own country. It is, after all, a democratic nation. Its obligation is to its people. Its obligation is to protect its own borders. It has gone very far in condemning Russia. It has gone very, very far in supporting Ukraine. Don't ask it to do more when you're not asking other countries in the world to put their own interests at stake. You're asking them only to support Ukraine and oppose Russia. Israel has done that. So I think this is a subtle form of international anti-Semitism, and it just has to stop. All right, one piece of news today. I did uh, write my letter to the Nobel uh, Prize uh, Committee. Um, faxed, FedEx, letter, wrote everything, um, and emailed and uh, nominating Zelensky for the Nobel Peace Prize. I'm a nominator. Nominators include any professor at public, of public law, constitutional law, criminal law, at major universities around the world. I've nominated probably 10 people, three of whom have gotten Nobel Prizes, so I have a pretty good record. So I've nominated Zelensky, and, and I asked the Nobel Committee to make a special exception, to convene now, to unanimously vote him the award and to give him the reward, the award now because we don't know if he'll be alive in the fall. And it will help save his life and it will help save the life of many Ukrainians if he gets the Nobel Peace Prize. I think even Putin would be less willing to risk world condemnation if he were to call for the assassination of a Nobel Peace Prize winner. So I hope the Nobel Committee uh, listens to me. Last nomination, they didn't listen to me. I nominated the people who devised the uh, Abraham Accords, uh, Jared Kushner and uh, David Friedman and uh, a couple of others, and they didn't get it. But I'm hoping this time maybe the Nobel Committee will listen, not only me, but I'm sure many other people will propose that award. Okay, so let's turn now to some questions. Um, so I read you the questions already about the no-fly zone. And here's a guy named The Montaigne who keeps asking me the same question over and over and over again. And I answered it, and he keeps saying I haven't answered it. So this time I'm going to answer it definitively so he'll stop writing this. He can write other things. He says, I keep asking a legitimate question. What's the difference between a treaty and an executive agreement? No one answers. And then he says, still no opinion. I'm still waiting on your opinion. Well, of course, I've answered. I answered it the other day when I said, if it looks like a treaty, if it quacks like a treaty, if it walks like a treaty, it's a treaty. A treaty is generally an agreement among nations, which bind nations. NATO is a treaty. It's even called a treaty, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. The Senate has to confirm that by a two-thirds vote. The Senate did do that. The Senate then voted to admit to the Treaty of Estonia, Latvia, and uh, Lithuania over the objection of a number of people, including me, but I'm not a senator, but the Senate gets to make that decision. An executive agreement is simply a deal that an incumbent president makes and can break. And so the prime example of that is President Obama illegally and unconstitutionally entered into a treaty, yes, it was a treaty, with Iran, England, Germany, France, a treaty to limit Iran's production of nuclear weapons in exchange for enormous amounts of money, including barrels of cash uh, flown over. Why did Obama call it an executive agreement or a deal or whatever he called it and not a treaty? Simply couldn't get two thirds of the Senate to approve it. He couldn't get a majority of the Senate to approve it. So he took it into his own hands. And then what happened? A Republican got elected, Donald Trump, and he rescinded the treaty. And everybody said, well, you can't rescind a treaty. No, you can't rescind the treaty. But you can rescind an executive agreement. And so Trump rescinded the executive agreement that Obama should never have been allowed 
to make. And now we're going to see whether or not President Biden enters into yet another executive agreement involving lots of countries that quacks like a treaty, looks like a treaty, and walks like a treaty. And I would hope that a senator uh, who objects to it, and there are many, I think a majority, but certainly more than a third, will go to court and say, no, 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 you can't do that. You can't circumvent the constitutional requirement. The president shall, with the consent of two thirds of the Senate, make treaties with other countries. That's what this is. So it's a good question. And I have finally and definitively answered it. Okay, next question. And it's a question that is about DeSantis, but it could also be about Biden. Because both of them say, look, I've said DeSantis and Biden are not nice guys. They are. I've met them both. I know them both. Um, and, and I like them both. And I disagree with them both. Okay, so here's the letter. You rave about DeSantis and then add, by the way, I'm not voting for him. I'm a Democrat. Doesn't that kind of blind loyalty to a party create the type of division we have now? How do you justify only voting for one party? If Harris is the candidate in 2024 with one of the squad as VP, will you similarly be required to vote for them over DeSantis? I have voted for both parties on the national and local level and would never limit my vote to one party. But then again, um, I'm a centrist. I'm often called right-wing zealot. Okay, look, I, I don't disagree with you. Yeah, if one of the squad members were nominated for president or vice president, I would vote against them. I would vote for the Republican candidate. Uh, I would vote for DeSantis over the squad. I have no doubt about that. But I'm not going to vote for a Republican over a Democrat who I think is good. I came the closest I ever came. And if I knew then what I know now, I would have voted for Romney over Obama uh, the second time. Uh, around. Um, um, I think he's the only one uh, that I ever came close to voting uh, for. I didn't like Lyndon Johnson, but I didn't like Barry Goldwater. I voted for Lyndon Johnson. I voted for John Kennedy. Uh, I voted for Jimmy Carter. I probably would not have voted for him the second time around. Um, um, if I knew what I knew then, I probably would have voted for Ronald Reagan. Um, and maybe I'll have an occasion to vote for a Republican uh, this time around, but it, it has to be a good Republican and or it has to be a bad Democrat. All things being equal, I support a woman's right to vote. I uh, of course, I support a woman's right to vote. A woman's right to choose, to choose an abortion. I support uh, a gay man's right or a woman's right to marry anyone they want to. I support climate control. I support limited gun control. I support separation of church and state. All of those are in the Democratic platform. And the opposite of most of those are in the Republican platform. So, of course, I'm a Democrat. I'm going to vote for candidates who support what I think is the right approach to uh, democracy. If, if it changed, if, if, if the American Republican Party ever came like the British Conservative Party, I'd probably become a British conservative. In, in Britain, the conservative party is opposed to the death penalty, and I'm opposed to the death penalty, favor a woman's right to choose abortion. They favor gay marriage. They favor reasonable gun control, climate control. Their difference with the other side is that they have a tougher foreign policy and more free market economics. I can live with that. I, I would be a conservative. I would be a Republican in America if the Republican Party didn't keep focusing on these social issues that uh, and religious issues um, that uh, uh, separate Americans and that will never get me to vote for them. I don't say never because, again, Bernie Sanders runs, the squad runs. I go pretty deep into the Republican Party before I could say I can't vote for a Republican. There are many Republican potential uh, candidates. Nikki Haley would be one, of course, uh, that I could vote for enthusiastically. Uh, depending on who the who the Democrat is. But I don't, not only look at the candidate, I look at the platform. And the platform of the Democrats has been much, much better, from my point of view, than the platform of the Republicans. And then, of course, you know, there's, there's a website that does the anti-Semite of the week every week. I guess on my show, I, I got to do every day the kind of anti-Semite of the day. This is a guy, Chucky Wucky. He writes to me quite a bit. Hey, Dushowitz, 
how is Epstein's Mossad Island? So we have to bring the Mossad in Israel into his island. How much blood did you drink, you Sabbatarian Ashkenazi lowlife? Uh, I don't even know what the rest means. NSA fusion centers have massive Mossad infiltration, just like Harvard University. They can't cover for you anymore. Nothing can stop what's coming to all of Zion. Karma, baby. Soon, even a tree will, climb, will cry out, hey, there's a Jew hiding behind me. Thank God, down with Zion, down with Satan's chosen people from the unholy land. So um, that's our anti-Semite for the day. Um, I hope maybe the time will come when I won't be able to read one of those because there won't be one of those. But uh, it's very important to lift up the rocks and see the slime that lives under those rocks because they're here and they talk to each other and they're on websites. And if they want to be on my website, I'm happy to read their trash and talk about it and leave it to the public to decide whether or not we're Satan's people. So keep writing to me, uh, The Durr Show. Uh, just scroll down, you'll find comments, do the comments. No censorship on The Durr Show. Um, See you on Monday if you want to see me on Locals. I'm on every single day. I have an opinion a day, and uh, you can hear me. So see you soon. Bye.